These are things that we have to have in our lives. Do we believe that God can supernaturally intervene in our lives? How else are they going to know? Out of all the religions in the world, how are they going to know that there's still that kind of power on the earth today? We've got to show them. Welcome to Christ the Healer with Don Allen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, turn with me to Exodus 14.2. Actually, let's skip down to, let's go down to Exodus 14.3. There's too many big names in, in, in 2 there for me to read. In Exodus 14 and verse 3, it says this, talking about Pharaoh. How many of you remember the story where Pharaoh is, is chasing down the children of Israel and Moses, and you, you remember that story in the Red Sea? Well, right here in, in Exodus... Uh, 14.3, it says this, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel that they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. As they were fleeing, he's saying, look, they're capturing themselves. The wilderness has got them blocked. And so when you look at what happens, you go on into verse 10, it says, Then Pharaoh drew near to the children of Israel, and they lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel, they cried out unto the Lord. We remember this story. They cried out unto the Lord. When you go on down into Exodus 15, 9, it says this. Then the enemy said, this sounds like our enemy today, doesn't it? I'm talking about the devil. This sounds just like him today. How many of you understand when Scripture says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? It also means the devil is the same yesterday, today. There's no new tricks. He, he's not coming up with anything new. And so when it says this here, it says uh, in Exodus 15, 9, it says, The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. I will huff. I will puff. I'll blow their little house down, in essence, is what he's saying there. I will destroy them, the enemy said. But then it says this. They said this to the Lord in verse 10. Thou did blow the wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. That they came after him, and what happened? We know that sea folded in over him, didn't it? When it looked impossible, something happened, didn't it? And so I want you to see in Proverbs 21 and verse 30, it says this, There is no wisdom. There is no understanding nor counsel against the Lord. I want to talk to you tonight about this one word. This one word called checkmate. Checkmate. See, we don't play chess in my house. We, uh, we've got a lot of contact sports in our house with all the kids that I have. Uh, we've got football going on, and we've got basketball, and we've got, foot, you know, we've got volleyball, we've got flag football. We've got, we've got all kinds of contact sports going on. Uh, we play checkers in our house. It's a little more our speed. Uh, but none of us have ever learned how to play chess in our house. Uh, and so, but in chess, I understand that, that you have on, on that board there, you have the war horses. You have uh, the knights and the bishops, and you have the queen, and you have the king. And if I understand this right, then the bottom line in chess is, is, is when the person wins, when a move is made in that game, then what happens is you, you've got uh, the king in a position where he's of total surrender, where he has no more moves. Uh, he can't move to the right. He can't move to the left. He can't move diagonally, front or back. You have that king in a position uh, surrounded by his enemies, and there's no escape. And the next words that come out of the person's mouth, who has the king in that position of surrender, is checkmate. Checkmate, meaning it's over. I've got you. You're trapped. You cannot escape. Checkmate. And I believe that hell's favorite word is checkmate. You have an adversary that wants to scream in your ear when you get that bad doctor's report. When you feel bad, when it seems like you're totally surrounded, when it seems like there's not another move that can be made, when it seems like there's nothing else that you can do, you know where to run, he loves to scream, checkmate. Meaning there's no way out for you this time. It's incurable. It, it, you can't get away from it. Nothing's going to happen for you. you. You can't move forward. You've run out of chances. You've run out of help. You've run out of money. Your, friends don't, your dog doesn't like you. It's over. And he likes to whisper, checkmate to us. But I want you to understand that when he yells checkmate, I want you to understand that all of heaven screams, I don't think so. I don't think so. 
He wants to put you in a position that he can say, there's no way out of this one. What's the use? It's untreatable. There's no cure. There's no options. And he wants you to live out the rest of your miserable days on the face of this earth in pain and in suffering and in sickness and in disease and being subject to all that that, that involves. And having to be on a schedule with your pills. And, and, and he wants you to be subject to that for the rest of your life. In John 10.10, 10, we know the Bible says this, that the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Did you notice the order? It's there for a reason. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's what he wants to do with us. See, it starts by stealing. See, how many of you understand, you know, when, when any of us have ever come up with a sickness or a disease or something in our life, it seems at the beginning we're pretty optimistic. Hey, I'm going to get out of this. You know, I mean, gosh, I've made it this far in my life. It's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it. And we, and we start out with thinking, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get in there and the doctors, they'll, they'll take care of me. And yeah, we'll get the, the group up there praying and I'm going to be fine and everything's going to be great. And we start out very optimistic and, and full of faith and, and joy. And we're like, hey, it's no big deal. I'm going to be all right. But then suddenly what happens is, is he wants to come in and he wants to begin to steal that faith. He wants to steal that joy from you that you had. He wants to steal your hope and steal your dream. Can you see it? You've experienced some of that in your life. And, and if you allow him to, what happens is, is we, when we come walking out of that situation where we've gone into the doctor's office and they've said, there's nothing more I can do. The report wasn't what you wanted to hear. And they got to that point where they said, there's no more that can be done. We cannot help you anymore. And at that moment, when you leave that place, suddenly all your joy is gone. All that hope that you had is gone. Your faith, no matter how much you were believing in the beginning, your faith is rocked at that moment. No matter how much you love the Lord, it's rocked. And that's the reality. And then what happens is, is our minds start to kick in. And they start to play out scenarios in our lives. Our minds will take us down this road as you're driving home from that doctor about how terrible it's going to be. How miserable it's going to be. How it's going to affect your family. How, how, how terrible this was. And I had hopes and dreams. I had plans. I had, I had things I was going to do. I had all these great plans and now, and all of this, and what it'll do is that'll even take you all the way down to where you're standing over your own casket in your mind. And all of this, if you'll allow the devil to do it, all of this will happen before you even get home from that doctor's visit. All your hopes out the window. All within the hour of getting that report. But I want you to, I want you to remember one thing tonight. I want you to remember this. You cannot forget the God factor. There's always a God factor. There's always something else that we can do. There's always one more move. And you better remember that if God be for me, amen? Listen, if God be on my side, there's always one more move that I can make. There's always one more thing that I can do. You understand that there's always something else that we can do. And listen, I need your help in here tonight. And what I need you to do is when I say checkmate, I want you to say, I don't think so. Are you ready? Checkmate. No, listen to me. I need you to say it with some attitude as though you actually believe that there's a God in heaven tonight who can destroy cancer and heal bodies and deliver people tonight. I said, checkmate. I See, I've got to get this into your spirit. I've got to get this down into your spirit because my Bible says there is no wisdom. There's no man's wisdom. There is no power, no power of sickness, no power of disease, no power of Satan, no power in hell. There's no counsel that can stand against our God. No counsel. And when the devil wants to come and play that game with us, we need to have that response in our hearts and it needs to be on your lips. I don't think so. Listen, who are they to say? At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves this question. Who are they to say? Who are they to say that they can come in and put an expiration date on your life? Who are they to say? Who are they to say that? It may look like there's no way out, but God. But God. We serve the Almighty God. He's got a really good track record of some miraculous comebacks. Amen. Amen. May I remind you of this story about Pharaoh that we started out talking about? You remember, here's Pharaoh, and he thinks that he's got God's children under his feet. You remember he was using them as slaves? He, he's abusing them, he's killing them, he's whipping them, using them however he wants to. And then here comes Moses. 
and he's going to come and he's going to set these people go uh, to set them free. And you remember that that Pharaoh was saying, listen, Moses, you, he can't even talk right. He's got a speech impediment. Who are you to send me this guy? He's stupid. He's got sheep's dung between his toes. He's worthless. This guy's been out in the desert wandering around, scared, hiding. And this is the guy that's going to bring deliverance to God's people? Yeah. Okay. And Pharaoh thought that he couldn't do it. And he said all these things about Moses. And what he did is he chased him down into an area. You remember, he, he says, yeah, I'll let you go. And then he changes his mind and he says, no, now we're going to come and get you because you left. He let him go and then chased it. That sounds like the devil, doesn't it? Just toying with you. Toying with you. And so what did he do? He lets him go. He chases him down into an area where they find themselves totally surrounded. They've got the Red Sea on the in front of them. Impassable. Mountains to the right. Mountains to the left. And he looks back behind him. And all he can see is the dust cloud from the chariots and the thundering of the horses and the hordes of all hell that are barreling down. And there is no way out. And you can almost hear it as they're coming down that valley. You can almost hear it on the hoofs of those horses. Checkmate. I don't think so. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> and so what we see happen is they're coming down there and all these forces are coming down in a cloud to wipe out an entire race of people now. Now it's not enough to just get Moses. They want to come down and kill every man, every woman, every child, all the people of God. He wants to wipe out an entire race of people. And you can hear it coming. And I want you to realize that there's something that we can do that God cannot do. And I know right away you want to say, well, yeah, God can't lie. And that's not what I'm talking about. There's one thing that we can do that God has never, ever done. One thing. All of us in this room and those that are watching on television, we can do all that we can do. God has never done ever all that he can do. God has never done all that he can do. I want you to see this in Habakkuk 3. The Bible says that God came down from Teman. All of a sudden, he comes down, and when he showed up, he put his glory on display. All of a sudden, the mountains are starting to shake. The very earth is starting to shake. God shows up on the scene. There's a bright light. Everything's going in chaos. All this is happening. And in verse 4, it says this, there was a hiding of his power. There was a hiding of God's power. And that doesn't mean what you think it means. There was a hiding of God's power. It doesn't mean that he was hiding something from the people. What he was saying was, is that God had a whole bunch more that he wasn't even showing yet. He had a whole bunch more coming that they hadn't even seen. Why? Because God never has done all that he can do. And as much as God has ever done for any of you in this room, and as much as you think you've ever seen a move of God, as many miracles as you think you've ever heard of, I want you to understand that He has held back some of that power. He's held back more than He's released. And I want to tell you something tonight. The Word of the Lord is this. You ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. You ain't seen nothing yet. God's got way more power. And just because the enemy thinks it's checkmate, we can scream, I don't think so, because God has a hiding of that power. God has a hiding of that power, and he's on your side, and he cares for you. You serve the almighty God. Who are we to say that we're ever stuck in an impossible situation when we have God on our side? Yeah. Never, ever. He's never going to give up on you. See, just when Moses thought that it was all over, God went and found him out in the desert hiding, didn't he? Just when, just when Joshua thought that it was all over for him and his brothers had thrown him in a pit and sold him off into slavery, what happened? God came and found him in a prison. Do you guys remember the three Hebrew boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're standing at the mouth of a fiery furnace and they're being told you will bow to these other gods right now or you will die. And they stood there and they said, we're not going to bow. I don't care if you throw me in. I don't care if you let me go. We're going to stand right here and say, I don't think so. And they threw them into that fire. And you have to understand something. They threw them into the fire because guess what? The miracle wasn't on the outside of the furnace. The miracle was in the fire. And there's going to be times you've got to get right in the middle of your mess, but understand something. When they leaned down and they looked inside of that furnace, they said, wait a minute, all of a sudden I see a fourth man. I see a fourth man in that furnace, and it looks like the son of the living God. And what was he doing? He was in that fire saying, 
I don't think so. And they came back out and didn't even smell like smoke. Just when it seemed all of hell was yelling checkmate. I don't think so. I don't think so. I want you to understand when you find the doctors writing you off, when the doctors are in the corner whispering about you, when your friends are starting to draw away because they know you're about to die and they don't want it to hurt them, when all this is starting to happen, I want you to understand that God has not given up on you. I want you to understand this. If you've given up on you, God still hasn't given up on you. I'm reminded of a story. When Matt and I, uh, when was this? About, I don't know, three, four, five, five years ago, maybe six years ago. Uh, we had a girl come into healing school and she'd been telling us about this friend of hers that was dying of cancer. She'd been diagnosed with cancer. And so she was telling us about her. She lived up in Shawnee, Kansas. And so she was telling us about this, this girl, this young mother had two children and a, and a husband and that she had been diagnosed with cancer. And so we were trying to make the connection to get to pray with her and, and minister to her. And we never could make the connection. Something would come up, something would happen. And it's, you know, a little over three hours away and we never made the connection. I remember it just like it was yesterday. It was a Sunday night right after Lake Invasion. And, and we're all worn out and we're done and we're showered up and ready to go to bed. And my phone rings and it's this girl up in Shawnee. And she says, listen, they've given her 72 hours to live. She's sitting on the couch right now, dying in front of her children and husband. They just plopped her on the couch. No meds, no nothing. Now it's that far. She's just sitting on the couch dying. And I need you to come. They've given her 72 hours to live. And I said, when was that? And they said, 75 hours ago. I said, well, we're on our way. So Matt and I drive up there. We get up there 1130, midnight or so. We come walking into the home. We kick all the ballers and squallers out. Told them, I'm sorry. We're not here to make friends. We're here to save a life. You got to go. All doubt and unbelief has got to get out of here. We booted them out and came in, and the little boy was sleeping at this time. The husband's over in a corner, bawling his eyes out. And the 14-year-old daughter is sitting on the couch, just stone-faced, solid. And so we walked in, and, and I sat down on one side, and Matt sat down on the other, and we began to pray. We began to minister. This woman, her eyes were rolled back in her head. She's barely breathing. She probably weighed 85 pounds. And she had on a nightgown, and the cancer was so bad that it had burst through her stomach and was oozing down the nightgown at this point. And so we came in and started ministering to her, praying with her as that daughter sat there and watched her mother die on this couch. And we began to minister, and we began to pray, and with everything we had in us, and suddenly, checkmate, she stopped breathing. And I looked over at that daughter, and she was just as stone-faced as could be, sitting there looking at us like, what are you going to do? And something on the inside of me said, I don't think so. And I grabbed a hold of the back of that woman's head, and I shoved her forward, and I said, you will breathe in the name of Jesus. And she took a big, deep breath, scared every one of us in the room. <laughs> she fell back, and we began to pray some more. And we prayed, and we prayed, checkmate, you can't do it twice. And she dies again stops breathing. I look over at the daughter and she's just sitting there waiting to see the salvation of the Lord. So what did we do? I grabbed her again and I said, you will breathe in the name of Jesus. She took a big breath, came back to life. We're sitting there praying and suddenly what happened? A third time. And this time we all began to laugh. We all begin to say, I don't think so. No, no, no. We've already played this game. I don't think so. You will breathe in Jesus name. And she came back to life. And so when Matt and I wrapped it up and we were heading out the door, she motions for her friend to come over and she whispers into her ear. Why did you all plan my funeral? I told you I was going to live. We left that place and we drove home, got a phone call at about 730 in the morning. This friend who had been stopping by to help take care of the children, she stopped by and guess who answered the door? The dead woman. She answered the door. Then she said, take me upstairs. I haven't had a shower in my own shower in weeks. And they took her upstairs. And when they began to unclothe her, all the bed sores were gone and there was no cancer. Why? When hell screams, checkmate, I say, I don't think so. And the church needs to stand up and cry, I don't think so. Who says you're going to die? Who says this cancer is going to kill you? No one. Not God. God didn't say it. God didn't say it. In Job 42, 16, Job had just gone through his crisis. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He had lost everything that he had had. And, and in Job, it says this, after this, after this, Job lived 140 years. After this, and I want you to understand tonight, God can give you an after this. 
God has an after this for you, after this drug addiction, after this doctor's report, after this cancer, after this pain, after this disease, you will live again. God will give you an after this. 140 more years. I want you to understand that God is going to give you life after this. And I'm not talking about in the sweet by and by. How many of you understand? I got some living to do today. I got some living to do today. I'm not talking about when you die. God will give you life on this earth. 140 years after his most severe trial and hell had come. And now I know that hell is whispering checkmate to some of us in this room. But I want you to understand the king has one more move. And I want you to know this, that he has held back some power for this hour. He's held back some power for this hour right here. In Genesis 9, 28, it says that Noah lived after the flood 350 years. 350 years he lived after the flood. He lived more after the flood than he lived before the flood. And you understand, Noah's whole world was literally wiped out. All the best people in the world called him a fool. Everyone was against him. And he went on that boat a minority, but he came off the majority. You have to understand, we've got to do what God tells us to do. There's life after your flood. Listen, you all think you got problems. We think we got, we got pain and sickness and disease that we can't get out of. We think that we have troubles. We think we have people against us. We think we have situations that we, we can't get out of. Things look impossible. I want you to understand that they took Jesus Christ... And they came, and what did they do? They found him, and they falsely accused him. All of a sudden, everyone that was for him seemed to be against him. His whole world was coming crashing down. And when he walked in, uh, they walked into that garden and, and betrayed him, and they took and arrested him. And they drug him into town. And what's the next move they make? They take him, and they put him in front of all those people. And as he's standing there and they're falsely accusing him, he's looking out at all the faces out there, the people that he healed, the people that he fed, the people that he loved, the people that he had done work for as a carpenter, the people that he had lived with in his hometown. He had done nothing wrong to these people, and yet every one of them were accusing him and mocking him and laughing at him and pointing at him. And every one of them said, when given the choice to make the decision, said, crucify him, crucify him. He'd done nothing wrong to these people. So what did they do? They took Jesus. See, the game started to be played. The chessboard was laid out. Pieces were being moved. And suddenly, all these moves are taking place. And what do they do? They take Jesus to a whipping post where they begin to beat him with rods to draw all the blood to the skin. Then what do they do? They get a whip and they tie in rocks and metal and glass because they knew that when they took that whip, what happened? We started to hear checkmate. Checkmate, Jesus, I've got you. Checkmate, Jesus. The moves were starting to be made. Things were starting to happen. All of a sudden, it's starting to look like that there's no protection for our king. What did they do then? They take him. They beat him. He's bleeding. They take him and they hung him on a cross. They hung him on a cross and they drive nails into his hands and into his feet. And suddenly we see the knights, the soldiers, are surrounding our king. All his boys have fled now. All his best guys have left him. They're already denying that they know who he is. Everybody has abandoned him, and now the king stands alone hearing checkmate. He's being surrounded by the enemy. They're coming in from every side. And they hung him on that cross where he had no more moves. He couldn't move right. He couldn't move left. He couldn't move forward. He couldn't move backwards. It was over. And let me tell you something. Jesus understands how you feel. Because even for a moment, he thought it was over when he hung on that cross and he said these words, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He even felt like he didn't have another move. And so they took him. And he uttered these words from his blood-cracked lips. He says this, It is finished. And you could hear, Checkmate. You could hear him say, checkmate. And they took him down off of that cross. And they took him to a tomb. And they put him in a tomb and they roll a huge stone in front of it. They put a governor's seal across that thing. And they put a guard on the outside. I mean, where's he going to go? He's not going anywhere. He's dead, right? And they take him in there. And all of a sudden, what happens? One day goes by. Two days go by. 
Third day rolls around and just when you think you're about to hear checkmate, suddenly an after that took place. The earth began to shake. That stone rolled out of the way. The angel of the Lord came and sat down on that. And when it seemed like Jesus couldn't move forward or backwards or right or left, he still had one more move and it was to rise straight up out of that tomb. And I want you to understand that there's always one more move that you can make. The king always has one more move for you. I want you to see this power. Because if he caused an earthquake there, then I want you to understand that God will move all of heaven and all of earth for you. If he caused an earthquake to literally shake and open up that tomb, he'll move earth for you. And just when it seems it's impossible and there's no more that can be done, there's always one more move. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says this, And what is the exceeding greatness the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Do you understand what that power is? The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. And just when death thought that it had yelled checkmate, some power came in. The power of God came in and rose that body from the dead. And it's the same power that's on the inside of each one of us. That same exact power, not some other power. It's the same power. The exact same power that was in the tomb. The exact same power that rose him from the dead is there and it's here today for you. It's that same power that it took to raise Christ from the dwell from the dead and what is it it's that exceeding greatness of one more move power and I want you to understand that your king always has exactly one more move for every one of you in Jesus name thank you for joining us today I just wanted to take a few moments and talk with you you know when the devil is whispering in your ear as he does to all of us when he's whispering checkmate I want you to always remember that this book contains the most miraculous comebacks through all the centuries of this world. Our God is a God of the miraculous comeback. And even though he's yelling checkmate, I want you to always remember to go back to this word. Remember what it is that God said to you. Go back and rehearse the other stories and, and look at the great triumphs where God got people out of impossible situations and he'll deliver you out of your impossible situation. Always remember, you serve the Almighty God, not just some God out there. He is the Almighty God, the same God of this book. And I want you to just take that time and focus and understand that when he's yelling that in your ear, I want you to stand and say, I don't think so. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today on Christ the Healer. We would like to present to you our powerful new resource. For a love gift of $50, you can request this preloaded MP3 player. This 4 gigabyte player comes preloaded with all 26 audio teachings of Christ the Healer Season 1, the 101 Healing Scriptures, and 11 Healing Power of God teachings. We would also like to offer you our free CD, an audio compilation of 101 Healing Scriptures. For more information and other products, please visit www.twoguysinabible.com or if you would like to request prayer, please call 573-693-2454. We thank all of the friends and partners who make the viewing of this program possible. If you have been blessed by this program, we ask that you would partner with us financially in impacting the world with the miracle message of Jesus Christ. Together, let's make Jesus famous again.